My grandma and grandpa, Neil and Jane Nellis, are no longer with us, but they did leave behind a 60,000 word book that records their story in their own words, their family histories, their conversions, their love story, and the account of their work in Mexico and Bible translation. So we're going to get into this story. It's a pretty long one, but I think you'll find it interesting. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. On January 14th in 1917, Neil Bergman Nellis was born into the Nellis family household as their firstborn son in Seattle, Washington. In 1917, on February 22nd, George Washington's birthday, Jane Scott Goodner was born in Gainesville, Texas. She was the fourth and last girl born to Ed and Mary Goodner. She was also the only one of the children to be born in a hospital. Now, my grandmother, Jane Nellis, has a really interesting family history that goes all the way back to Robert II, King of Scotland, in 1316. And if you skip down a few generations, you get to Andrew, the second Lord of Oakletree, commonly called the Good, who took a prominent part with the leaders of the Reformation. He married Agnes, daughter of John Cunningham, by whom he had four sons and two daughters. Of these, the youngest was Lady Margaret Stewart, who became the second wife of reformer John Knox in 1564. They had three daughters, and if you continue following down their family history, which I won't bore you with, you eventually get to my grandmother. So I'm related to John Knox through my grandmother on my mom's side. She writes... One of the things that all four of us girls had to do was memorize the Westminster Shorter Catechism. You had to remember 107 questions and answers. Then someone at church would listen to you say it. You had to say it all at one time with only one mistake and one assist allowed. I did mine when I was 14 years old. I think Marguerite said hers at an earlier age. Then if you said it, you would get a large diploma sent to you from the Christian Observer. Our parents had them framed and hung them in the house. But more important were the truths and basic doctrines of Scripture that were instilled in us at an early age that we could use the rest of our lives. Now, she was saved at a revival at a young age. She goes on to write, Mother had always wanted to be a missionary. When she was a teenager, she had already volunteered for missionary service. She was the oldest in her family. So when her father died, when she was 25, she was left to care for all her brothers and sisters and a sickly mom. She began to teach piano to provide for her family. However, it made it almost impossible for her to go to the mission field. Later, when she married Daddy, they both decided to go, but the door was always closed. Mother and Daddy were thrilled that some of us were wanting to go to the mission field. Of primary importance to them was that we know God and serve Him as best we could wherever we were. Marguerite had decided that she would go as a missionary to China when she was only nine years old. This was her older sister, and she never wavered all through school and college, one year at Moody Bible Institute and one year at Biola, including eight years of Latin. And she fulfilled her vow to God in 1933 during the Depression by joining the China Inland Mission and going to China. Well, that had a profound effect on all of us younger girls. We were always giving offerings for missionaries, praying for them, especially Marguerite, and we would eagerly await her letters from China. I had also made a commitment to serve as a missionary. Our family attended Hollywood Presbyterian Church when I was in high school. Now, eventually, she went to Bible school, and she writes, Here I was in Bible school, finally preparing for God's service. I had been a member of the full-time life volunteers that were all going to be missionaries, but now I was faced with some pretty important decisions. I had never had a desire to go to Africa, and because of my sister and her husband working in China, I did feel drawn to that country. 
I remember one day, Daddy asked me what I thought about serving in Mexico. Well, around the Los Angeles area, many of the crimes were committed by Mexicans, and I had never gotten to know any Mexican people. But my first reaction was, oh no, I can't stand Mexicans. That was terrible of me to judge a whole nation by a few bad cases. In retrospect, that is humorous because now I know how wonderful they really are and what precious friends and wonderful Christians they can be. We came to love them so much, and they would demonstrate worlds of love to us. Now, one thing you should know about my grandmother is that she became very well known for her singing, especially in the area of California where she grew up and where her home church was. She tells a little anecdote about her father proposing to her mother. She said, Daddy used to tell of the time he took mother out in a horse and buggy to propose to her. He said, Mary, I love you. Will you marry me? And she replied, oh, yes, Ed. Then they rode on in silence for several minutes. Finally, Mary said, aren't you going to say anything else? And Daddy said, I think I've said enough already. Of course, that is always the way he told the joke. But there was never any doubt in anyone's mind that he loved Mother to a fault. Now, my grandpa chimes in here, and he says, Before the Depression, my father and I would hop in the family car, and we'd enjoy many hours together at our favorite fishing hole. Dad was very talented with his hands. He also did painting, plumbing, roofing, and even gardening. I never had a knack for carpentry, and I think Dad realized it and encouraged me to try other work. I have two younger sisters, Trudy and Norma. We were always very close. We were a theatrical team that many considered quite talented. I say that because we would win prize money in practically any stage competition we participated in. Trudy and I sang and tap danced. Mother designed our costumes, helped us to arrange our routines, and she would accompany us on the piano. Father was our chauffeur and cheerleader, and Norma would perform gymnastics and stunts to music, which might remind one of Shirley Temple. She was just a little tyke at the time. Norma won a free course to study at one of the best dance studios in Seattle because of her talent. I entered the University of Washington in 1934 and graduated in 1938. It was during the coming out of the Great Depression and before the U.S. entered into World War II. Although I had been raised in a very moral and loving home, I had no knowledge of the true and living God. I knew nothing of the Bible and what it taught concerning Jesus Christ or God's plan of salvation. In spite of that, in ways unknown to me, God was working in my life. The high moral standard instilled in me by my parents had kept me out of most of the worldly troubles such as drunkenness, laziness, and rebellion against authority. There was a thirsting for truth and fulfillment that could not be quenched by the wells of human intelligence or materialism. Once in a while, our cousin would invite us to attend a congregational church. The first clear gospel presentation came during my junior year at the university. I had a friend named Herbert Butt. Herbert became a Christian through the ministry of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. I thought my friend had gone over the edge. He had become a fanatic. At least I thought so then. He was constantly inviting me to go to prayer meetings and InterVarsity Christian Fellowship meetings. I never cared to go. He was always quoting scripture and giving me the salvation message, but I was just not ready. If I saw Herbert coming, I would purposely avoid him. Occasionally, I would attend the University Christian Church. It was a modern, liberal church. I and my sisters even sang in the choir. The messages were watered down. There wasn't enough of the gospel in the sermons to infect anyone with salvation. The hymnal that they used was one in which every reference to the blood of Christ had been removed. I remember the pastor very well. After I became a Christian, I went back and shared the good news of salvation with him. While I was in college, my sister Trudy and I would make extra money through our singing and dancing at theaters. All of a sudden, conditions changed and more and more folks were going to see motion pictures. Trudy and I were getting too big for the stage and we weren't professional enough to try out for the movies. So with great sadness, we broke up the Nellis Twin Dance and Song Act. 
My last two years at the university, I worked in the statistics department of the Department of Fisheries. It was very challenging, but also related to my major. When I graduated from the University of Washington, majoring in ichthyology, a branch of zoology specializing in the study of fish, I found a summer job at a fish hatchery located on the creek that flows around the base of Mount St. Helens in Washington. The superintendent's wife was very astute and realized that I was struggling within. She must have been a Christian. I considered myself to be an agnostic at the time. I just didn't think that you could know the truth. During my terms of study at the University of Washington, I belonged to a philosophy club and was even president of it one time. I thought that modern science had the answers for almost everything. At the same time, I realized its limitations. One day, she asked me what it was that I was reading. I told her about Schopenhauer and what he taught. She said, why don't you read some of the Greek philosophy in the New Testament? So I thought, why not? I began to read through the New Testament. It was thrilling, so full of life and hope. Rays of light were coming into my soul, but the enemy of our souls had his agent there to plant doubt. My work partner at the fish hatchery was an atheist. He just tore down every bit of faith or interest that I had. He pulled me back down to my former estate. When the summer ended, I was practically back to my agnostic position. I couldn't wait for what lay ahead. The University of Hawaii had offered me a fellowship to study for my master's degree. My folks thought that I had succeeded. They were quite proud of their scientist son. Before I left on this new adventure, my parents said that I should take a break and visit my aunt and uncle down in Oakland, California, since I would be leaving from nearby San Francisco and hadn't visited them since 1923. Before I left Seattle, I made the rounds of saying farewell to my friends. I visited Herbert Butt, my friend who had been saved through the Ministry of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and who was now an area representative. Herbert had a job at the Seattle Public Library, running their elevator. As I rode up and down in the elevator with him, he once again witnessed to me, and with tears in his eyes, told me that he was still praying for me. He was so burdened for my soul. But I was still rebellious and full of rebellious answers. I traveled down to San Francisco with great anticipation. I bought a ticket to Hawaii on one of the ships and stowed my trunk on it. My ship was not to leave for a few weeks, so I went to Pittsburgh, California to visit my relatives. I didn't realize what this little side trip was going to do to change the course of my life. My aunt and uncle were very happy to see me, and I was glad to get reacquainted, especially with their four sons. I was put in the bedroom with the guys. I really hit it off with my cousin Bob. Bob was a very strong Christian, and before long, the conversation turned to spiritual themes. Bob knew the Bible well, and he was well-versed on history, the Reformation, and knew about the life and teachings of some of the great Christians of the past. Every time I would bring up a teaching of some famous atheistic philosopher, Bob would counter with scripture. As I would talk so surely about evolution and science, Bob would talk about the Lord of creation and salvation. I was on shaky ground, but Bob was on the rock. Here I was, a university graduate, and this cousin of mine was just a Bible school graduate. But he had the answers to life, and all I had were questions. He was so serene in his faith and unconcerned about the future. As we talked long into the nights, Bob would open his Bible and show me what different passages taught, and I began to realize that there was something greater than science, something greater than what I was giving my life to. During the warm summer days, I was helping the family paint their house, and as Bob and I were working side by side, I said to him, Bob, in light of all you have told me, I don't think I can go on the way I have. Bob was very startled when I said I was thinking of giving up my fellowship to the University of Hawaii. I said, Bob, I sure wish you would pray with me about this. 
Bob began to get very worried. He didn't want to get blamed for me quitting my master's program. So Bob said, you better go and pray about it yourself. What a confused young man I was as I went on a quiet walk. I found a hill and wandered up to the top. It was beautiful, quiet, and peaceful there as I looked out over the estuary, meandering peacefully below. I pondered especially one thing that Bob and I had talked about. I had been telling him that no one could know the truth. He opened his Bible to John fourteen six and read, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I was so disturbed by that verse that I attacked him for being so dogmatic. Bob said, well, the truth can afford to be dogmatic. Exasperated, I said, there is no absolute truth. It's only if you consider it to be absolute. Bob replied, Neil, it does not matter what you say or what I say. It's written down here, and it will be here long after you and I are gone from this earth. Bob was so confident in his faith. I just wished I could have had his confidence. As I sat alone on that hill, I looked down at the rock I was sitting on. There were fossils encrusted in the limestone. That was something that my scientific side could understand. Reliable proof. But what was a rock with fossils from the ocean floor in it doing way up on this hill? It struck me like a bolt of lightning that maybe the story of Noah and a great universal flood was true, and that evolution was wrong. After all, evolution itself was just a largely unproven theory. I remembered back to a zoology class where my skeptic teacher ridiculed Noah and the Genesis account. After that class, a small group of students, who were Christians, went down to discuss this with him. He was very militantly anti-biblical, but as I looked back now, I realized that he didn't have any facts to back up his position. Those students were right. My friend Herbert Butt was right. My cousin Bob was right. And more than that, the Word of God was right, and you could know truth. I thought back to my believing Lutheran grandfather. He was right too. I fell to my knees beside that rock, struggling to speak to God, to express my innermost longings and burdens and doubts. Words did not come. What a battle Satan was waging to hold on to my soul. Finally, there was a breakthrough, and I got out some simple brief statements to God. I felt a terrific peace. I by no means had a grasp on the whole plan of salvation, but God had accepted my inadequate words as he read my searching heart. And as I came down from the hill, a voice spoke to me these words, Go, and I'll be with you. Go, and I'll be with you. I made a decision to study at the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, where Bob had gone. The hardest thing for me to do was to tell my family. This was the first major independent decision I had ever made. They were sad because I had gained a career and then abandoned it, but they allowed me to do what I thought best. I had had very few good teachers at the university. They were outstanding men in their fields, specialists, but they were not pedagogues. But some of the teachers at Biola were so fine. They knew how to teach, how to make disciples, and how to answer questions. I would pester them all the time. I made some lifelong friendships at Biola. One friend, Ed Case, became a member of Wycliffe Bible Translators, and then after serving in the armed forces in World War II, he and his wife, Betty, joined Child Evangelism Fellowship. They served in Havana, Cuba, and Mexico City. Most importantly, they had a son named Dan, who later married my daughter, Dorothy. So, a parenthesis here, Ed is my grandfather on my dad's side, so if you haven't heard his episode, which is a couple episodes back, you should check that out. Now, as a student at Biola, you were encouraged to attend a missionary prayer group. I looked up to a couple, the Hooks, that went to work in Tibet as missionaries. I became very interested in going to Tibet or China myself. Another of my friends, Nash, went to Africa. 
I read a book called Behind the Ranges by J. O. Fraser of the China Inland Mission, which is still popular and edifying today. Isabel Kuhn's books about pioneering in China were very influential in my desire to go to China as well. Also, I had the privilege to know Harry and Marguerite Owen, who were veteran missionaries with the China Inland Mission. Harry would give very inspiring messages from the scriptures at Biola. Of course, I later became their brother-in-law. So, if you remember, Marguerite was my grandmother's older sister who went to China. Now, we had some very wonderful guest speakers at Biola. Doctor Schofield would come, and I remember him preaching in the Gospel of John. He would spend hours on each verse and held you spellbound. One of the most life-changing speakers for me was Alan Cook. He spoke at our missionary banquet near the end of my time at Biola. Mister Cook had just finished translating the Lisu New Testament in China. He held a copy up and thanked God that now the Lisu people could read about. And follow the living God. This was my first introduction to Bible translation. This led me to take a phonetics course, and William Cameron Townsend of Wycliffe Bible Translators came one time and spoke to my class. After this, I took a course in Greek because I felt God might be leading me into Bible translation work. The first time I noticed Jane was on the tennis court. Glenn Lawrence and I had gone to play tennis. She was very athletic and was the life of the party. Wherever she was, people were happy, and she was in the epicenter. Now they ended up working together as volunteers for a British outreach called Beach Evangelism. And he goes on to write: Jane and I both had a love of music, and both of us had training and God-given gifts in that area. We began to realize that we had a lot of things in common, including a desire to go to China as missionaries. But that door shut as China fell into the hands of communism. I had read about Camp Wycliffe in a small magazine called the Sunday School Time, and heard Cameron Townsend speak at Biola. So I wrote Jane a letter and said I thought we should go to Camp Wycliffe after we got married. Wycliffe not only trains translators, but the linguistic training you receive will help you learn any foreign language better, as well as teach you to be culturally sensitive and relevant. Jane had the very same idea and had written me about Camp Wycliffe, and our letters crossed in the mail. Jane had admired one of the pioneer missionaries with Wycliffe Bible Translators in Mexico, Nadine Weathers. Jane would write her each month and send her one dollar. A dollar went further then. Nadine wrote and told her that the Wycliffe members in Mexico were praying for fifty new members for the next year. She said that Camp Wycliffe was very good for those who had to learn a foreign language, so God was gently leading us to service with Wycliffe in Mexico. So we fast forward, and they got married, and then left straight for training at the Summer Institute of Linguistics. My grandfather writes, Jane and I arrived two weeks late, and boy, did we have some catching up to do. We studied phonetics, phonemics, universal grammar principles, and some anthropology. Doctor William Wonderly taught grammar from his experience in Soki. Doctor Eugene Nida taught grammar and anthropology. Doctor McCrowry, Doctor Kenneth, and Mrs. Evelyn Pike and Eunice Pike all worked together to teach us phonetics and phonemics. I was so impressed by the quality, scientific approach, and faculty. Of course, at the same time, we had to write about three hundred thank yous for our wedding gifts during this intensive training period. Mr. W. Cameron Townsend had spent fourteen years in Guatemala as a missionary to the Cachiquel people. He had gone to that country in 1917 as a Bible seller, but in a short time he realized the tremendous need of the indigenous people to have the Word of God in their language. He therefore devoted himself to learning the Kachiket language. In 1923, the Gospel of John was published by the American Bible Society, and in 1931, the entire New Testament was published in Kachiket. Because of ill health, Mr. and Mrs. Townsend were unable to continue on the field, but they still saw startling results from their work. The Kachikel Church, instead of suffering from the absence of their missionaries, 
grew rapidly because it had the impetus of the word in its own language. Mr. Townsend realized that this was the secret of successful work among the many unreached language groups of the world, to give them the Bible in their own language, so that with the aid of the Holy Spirit they could evangelize their own people. To him, then, there was the vision of founding a linguistic training camp where prospective pioneer missionaries who had already seen service in pioneer fields and had come face to face with the terrific problems of reducing an unwritten language and translating the scriptures into it might be prepared for a scientific approach to the language problem. Camp Wycliffe was started in the summer of 1934 in an abandoned farmhouse at Sulphur Springs, Arkansas. This was indeed a humble beginning with only two students, but over the next few years, the number grew and more and more missionaries had benefited from the developing field of linguistic studies. Not only that, but the linguistic world in general was gaining from the investigations of these early linguistic missionaries. In 1941, because of the linguistic contributions, Camp Wycliffe was invited to hold its sessions on the campus of the University of Oklahoma. By 1942, it was decided that the time had come to formally organize a mission board. Previous to this time, both Camp Wycliffe and the workers in Mexico had been sponsored by the Pioneer Mission Agency. At the conference of workers held at that time, it was decided that two corporations should be formed with identical memberships and a board of directors. The one was Wycliffe Bible Translators Incorporated, which represented the evangelical side. The second was the Summer Institute of Linguistics, which was to be the scientific investigative arm of the work, using quality linguistic study to produce a high-quality translation of the New Testament. There was some discussion as to what to call the other organization. Early participants had labeled the summer sessions Camp Wycliffe, but when it was time to get formal, there was some sentiment for naming the group after William Tyndale. A hand vote was taken of the members, and but for a few hands, they could have been called Tyndale Bible Translators. After training at the Summer Institute of Linguistics, we were planning to go back to work with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship until China opened up again. One night, Uncle Cam had the devotional time. He said, China is closed, and other doors are closed, but Mexico is wide open, and God wants these tribal people to hear the word. And our hearts were just ready to answer the call and to move through the open door. Everything else was so unsettled, we didn't have an ounce of money, and all of our wedding gifts were in California, but we had willing hearts, so we decided on Mexico as our field of service. We wrote to mom and dad in California who said they would bring out appropriate wedding gifts for us to take with us to Mexico. We couldn't think of any reason to keep us from going directly to Mexico after our training. We wrote friends and relatives and prayed about the support we would need and left it in God's hands. On August 3rd, a young couple came to us and said they would like to be part of the work. They decided to support us for $3 a month. It wasn't a lot, but it was significant in that it was like God's seal of approval on our going. Our quota to live in Mexico at that time was $70 a month. So after raising a little more support, they took a train to Laredo, Texas, and then got on a train to Mexico City. My grandpa writes, We had no idea what lay ahead. We had to be careful with finances, as we didn't have all of our support. Jane began to get very weak. She couldn't climb stairs, and basically she was so weak, all she could do was sit around. We had no idea at all what was wrong. Had she eaten the wrong food? What was going on? So they went to another city to a doctor that was recommended, and lo and behold, they found out she was pregnant. So my grandmother writes, what a bombshell. I hadn't had any morning sickness, and one doctor had told me that I would probably never have any children. So here we were, new to Mexico, hardly knowing a word of Spanish, novices to the culture, just green missionaries and about to be parents. 
To summarize train travel at that time, it was full, overflowing with humanity and barnyard creatures and very uncomfortable. And Jane had to give herself injections all along the way to Oaxaca. We arrived there not knowing what tribe God would have us work with. Wycliffe had not yet developed its methodological language survey techniques, so we really did not know the areas of greatest need or population numbers or how many languages there were both in Mexico and worldwide. At this time, each individual language team would have to travel, talk, visit, analyze, and pray before deciding where to begin work. After narrowing down some options, my grandparents decided to work with the Zapotec people of the Sierra Juarez. My grandpa writes, It was a Zapotec man who came down out of the mountains, learned Spanish, trained to be a lawyer, and led the Mexican people through the Mexican Revolution and became the president of Mexico. Uncle Cam wrote, The great Mexican statesman of the last century, Benito Juarez, is an outstanding example of an Indian who changed culture. Benito Juarez changed his culture, ascended to heights, which led to his being officially declared benefactor of the Americas. Almost 75 years ago, Benito Juarez was president of Mexico, and yet his descendants are still living in poverty and illiteracy and spiritual bankruptcy. So we feel called to carry the word of life to this group. So in December 1942, we came around the bend of the last curve of the bumpy, joggy road in a Ford truck from Oaxaca City, and we saw our first glimpse of our little town of Islan de Juarez. Every way we looked, there was beauty. The flowers here and there, the high green carpeted mountains in every direction, and the beauty of knowing that the Lord had planned for us to give God's word from the foundation of the world. The friendly, smiling greetings from everyone warmed our hearts and continued to assure us that this was God's gift to us. We were able to rent one side of a duplex house on a corner. We became good friends with a family that owned a store in town. It was good that they owned a store because I would come in with my Spanish-English dictionary and look up words for things like matches or shortening, and they were very patient with me. They had a daughter-in-law that had lived in the States, so they were very helpful. You can get in a lot of trouble when you don't know a language. One time, Jane went into a meat market in Oaxaca City and asked for a pound of ternura, tenderness. And the men there seemed very interested to oblige. What she wanted was a pound of ternera, veal. In the early days in the Mexico branch of Wycliffe, none of the missionary wives had children in Mexican hospitals. When we were about six months along, we would travel back to the U.S. to have our children. So as we were starting our work in the mountain town of Islan, it was Jane's time to head up to the U.S. I took her on the old rickety rocking bus to Oaxaca City for a flight that would take her to Mexico City and then on to Los Angeles, California. I stayed working on language learning until I received the news that I was a father of a healthy baby boy. We had decided that if we would have a boy, we would name him after Jane's dad. I shut up our small home and headed up to California to bring back my family. Now, fast forward five months, and my grandfather writes this, Our blue-eyed, dimpled baby boy is now five months old. It's a thrill to watch the Lord fashion his life day by day. He adds so much joy to our home as he laughs and coos and crawls all over his bed, turning over from his stomach to his back most of the time he's awake. He has been a door opener, too, for many have come to see the new white baby, and each contact usually means another friend to whom, God willing, we will give the gospel to. We're grateful for each new linguistic discovery. This means that we're that much closer to clear communication and to beginning translation. We have a few hymns translated, and each day the language becomes a little more familiar. We're working diligently each day on language assimilation and conversation. Also, we're doing a phonological analysis so that we can create an alphabet. This language has never been written, only spoken, so we must begin with the basics. 
Our next door neighbor, Pancha, a dear Zapoteco lady who shows evidence of a longing hunger in her soul, stopped by the other day. When she saw us studying with pages of text before us, she expressed a desire for us to teach her how to read in her own language. The Lord is already preparing hearts for His translated word. We didn't realize that when we gave our child to God, even before he was born, that God would take him so soon. But that is his privilege. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. About 15 days before our boy went to be with the Lord on September 10th, he was strong, healthy, and happy. His sickness was so gradual that we thought at first a change of milk was all that was necessary. After changing milk several times without any signs of improvement, we realized that he had a severe case of dysentery and needed medical attention immediately. Jane had trouble on the nine-hour bus trip up the mountain to Islan. There was no way to heat up a bottle and to prepare formula, and Edward was unusually fussy. When he wouldn't drink his formula, we tried evaporated canned milk with water to feed him, but he wouldn't take it. From the time Edward arrived back in Islan, he was very sick. Being new parents and given the primitive conditions, there was very little we could do. There was a clinic in town, so we took Edward there. We couldn't speak Spanish, so we used sign language and our little pocket dictionary. We were shocked by the doctor's diagnosis. Edward had some sort of gastrointestinal ailment, and the doctor said that he would die. We heard there was another doctor about 10 miles away that worked for a mining company. We got a message through to him, and he was very kind and helpful. He even sent a truck to pick us up. This doctor was very understanding, and even more important, he spoke some English. We found out that Edward had some sort of friction of the intestine. He passed about 15 little black stools every day, and then he went into a coma for three days. That doctor lovingly tended little Edward with everything that he should have. We found out later that he had treated him correctly and no one could have done more. During the three days that Edward was in a coma, there was a priest at the same clinic trying to persuade us to let him baptize Edward. The priest was from Islan and was there because of a ruptured appendix. The priest recovered and Edward died. Then the priest told us that we should have let him baptize Edward because now his soul was in limbo and there was no hope for him. The priest told many people that he had tried to save the soul of our child, but we wouldn't let him. The day before the burial, the Lord sent Jane's mother and dad, who were a well of blessing to our souls. He knew we needed their comfort and fellowship at this crucial time. On this same day, many of our friends in town brought flowers and our hearts were touched with their love, kindness, and thoughtfulness. When new friends were made and old friendships were strengthened, we saw how the Lord was using the death of our son to magnify his name. By Sunday afternoon, the little white-covered casket was surrounded with bouquets of flowers above which hung the lovely motto, Seguro con Jesús, Safe with Jesus with John 14.6, which Neil had made. The four of us conducted the service and found even in this difficult situation that His grace was sufficient. Mother played hymns on her little organ, Neil read scripture and prayed in Spanish, and Jane sang, Jesus is all the world to me, also in Spanish. Also, Daddy, Neil, Jane, Margarita, our language assistant, sang, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. At the grave site, Daddy led in prayer after the flowers had been laid on the mound. As we left our home, it was a precious sight to see around 30 children preceding us to the cemetery, each with a bouquet of flowers, as well as about 50 adults accompanying us. Many of their heathen customs were broken in this funeral, and each change gave us an opportunity to witness of our Lord. When asked if we were going to burn candles all the night to give light to the baby and us, we were able to tell them that our baby was already with the Lord, who is light eternal, and that he also dwells within us so that we need not fear the darkness. When Margarita, our language assistant, sang with us, she was openly proclaiming that she had given her life to the Lord, and what a thrilling testimony it had been.
What quiet joy floods our souls each time we explain to inquirers about the peace in our hearts as a gift from the Lord. We had a special visit from Anne Sherman and Joy Ritterhoff, the founder of Gospel Recordings. Joy would teach some lessons, and she spoke Spanish, and she was very effective in soul winning. She spent night and day telling our friends about Jesus. Anne opened their hearts with her lovely singing and joyous presence. They not only fed and strengthened the believers, but refreshed our souls as well. Joy gave simple salvation messages right to the point, and 17 of our neighbors gave their hearts to Christ. My grandmother writes, Joy saw us stumbling around with our broken Spanish and asked me, Jane, how do they understand you? And I said, they must. They give me back the right answer. We laughed at that, but Joy then suggested that we take some time to study Spanish. So we took off a month and were tutored in Spanish. It wasn't much, but it was a start and a help. During this year, Gospel Recordings was just getting off to a start in making records for indigenous languages. It was just Joy and Anne that made up all of the personnel. They were in Mexico for some months at this time, and by the time they were ready to leave, they had made master records in 33 languages, 25 of them in tribal groups in which no scripture had yet been introduced. This was the year that they became interested in supplying portable hand-powered record players to send along with the thousands of gospel recordings they had made. Gospel recordings has always had a hand-in-hand ministry with Bible translation organizations. They provide trained personnel, professional equipment, and expertise in recording scripture, Christian songs, Bible stories, and doctrinal teaching onto cassettes and records in the different languages. Then they provide hand-wind tape recorders and phonographs for those who can't afford batteries. They're a faith ministry and don't charge for these very strategic and wonderful services. It really makes a difference to have these recordings in the villages to listen to. The Lord has filled these days with evidences of His power in the lives of these dear people. In May, two of the school teachers accepted the Lord as their Savior, and during one night while we were having a sing time, two of the children accepted the Lord. A few weeks later, another boy put his trust in Christ. So, during this time, the Lord has called seven people to faith— And as a bonus, Neil has been able to translate six chapters of John's gospel. Now, then they decided to move to a smaller, more monolingual village called Atepec. Atepec was about six hours away on a mountain trail, and it had a population of about 2,000 people at the time. My grandfather writes, because of the change to this purer dialect, we have almost had to start all over again. But of course, our past experience has helped a lot. We have two fine native helpers, but they cannot understand the gospel in Spanish, so they must have it in their own language. The tone was quite a challenge in the language. And now for an interesting tangent, which involves a love story and Uncle Cam, the founder of Wycliffe. On December 24th last year, Elvira Townsend had died. So, our dear friend Uncle Cam, who was stretched in every way organizing Wycliffe's growth and outreach in new areas of the world as God opened the doors and provided workers, was now a widower. We had made friends with a vibrant and attractive school teacher named Elaine Milkey, who was Wycliffe's first school teacher. She taught missionary children in a small makeshift classroom in Tetelcingo. Elaine was a much-needed addition to Wycliffe. She had been named Chicago's Outstanding Young Protestant at age 20 and was awarded with a trip around the world. Six years later, she was the supervisor for special education in over 300 schools. Elaine had promised God that she would support four missionaries from her salary, but she found out that the Lord wanted a full-time commitment. She attended SIL in 1942 with us and went as Wycliffe's first support worker in 1943. Now, in the later part of 1945, we saw a romance in bloom. Everybody was rooting for them. 
Elaine was a good friend of Jane's and would confide in her about a poem that Cameron had written for her or something else sweet that he had done. Uncle Cam always wanted to be where she was, and we had the two of them over for dinner. Neil and Cameron would play chess, but they would get distracted when they discussed Elaine. Even then, it was a surprise when they announced their engagement. They were married the next year at the home of President Cárdenas, the president of Mexico, April 4th, 1946. God had truly planned that union as Elaine was every bit as dynamic as Uncle Cam. What a wonderful team they have made as they followed the vision God had given them. Now let's talk about some of the Sabatec beliefs they encountered. My grandpa writes, When we arrived, the biggest thing that we noticed was that every Sabatec home had little statues or idols that represented various gods or saints that they prayed and sacrificed to. The prominent statues were of the Virgin Guadalupe and the Black Christ from Huquila. They would also put crosses on their houses in order to have good luck and to ward off evil. They believed in the land god or master of the dirt and earth, Beto Shanap. They would talk to that evil spirit as if he were right there in the house. In illness, they would make sacrifices to the demon so that he would heal, or if a person fell down or had some kind of accident, they would sacrifice to the demon for having offended him, for having tripped or fallen down, or for having one of their animals die on his territory. So they would sacrifice chickens and turkeys to this demon. This was an extreme hardship because of the poverty. One man told us exactly what he did trying to get well. His ox had died on the demon's property, so he made nine little crosses with flowers on them, twelve tortillas, one for each of the apostles, and over that was poured whiskey or tequila, also some cigarettes and parts of a chicken to appease the demon. Then he took an article of clothing that was his and made a doll out of it. He rubbed that doll across the sacrifice and told the demon to come out of him so that he could get better. Later, when this man had not been healed, he came to the clinic. He was sent to Puebla for an operation, and he had tuberculosis of the bone. They had to take a slice of the bone from his hip to graft it into his wrist bone. And after this, he finally got well. Not all of the families in the village still practice this or even believe it, but many do. Many still do hold on to the old beliefs and traditions. They also believe certain old tales, like if your ear aches and pus runs out of it, it's because you have eaten honey. If a child eats dirt, he won't talk. Or if you cut a small child's hair, he won't learn to talk. There's a little bug that plays dead that they wear around their necks on a chain to ward off evil spirits. And when the women are in the process of childbirth, they'll crack eggs into her mouth to keep her from screaming. She bites the shells and drinks the raw egg while spitting out pieces of shell. They probably think it keeps pain away. So from the first weeks in Atepec, the people were very accepting of these strange outsiders. A man named Don Mardonio helped my grandfather compose a letter in Zapotec, which he read to the people, to let them know why they had come to live among them. It also reassured them that the newcomers were there with the permission of the Mexican government. After they were in the village a few weeks, a strange incident occurred. One night, there was a flaring red light that lit up the dark community, followed by a loud explosion. The Sabatecs were very frightened, and many ran to my grandparents' house to see if they knew what was going on. Neil and Jane thought that maybe a plane had crashed in the nearby forest. The people were seized with panic and asked them if this was God's judgment on them because of their badness. Jane went back into the house and got a copy of the Spanish Bible. They both shared about what God said about judgment and sin, and they talked about the book of Revelation and the judgment to come. My grandfather said to them, Jesus is the one who speaks up in favor of us. He is our mediator. 
This event really opened people's hearts to hear the gospel. One of the first things some of the men wanted after this was to learn about the teachings in the book of Revelation. With the first rays of dawn, a group of men and my grandpa set out for the immense pine forest covering the top of the mountain. A meteorite appeared to have caused the explosion, since they found a large burned area and a piece of blackened rock among the trees. The people really believed that this was a sign of God's power and his coming judgment. Anyway, this is all for part one. Thanks for listening and being interested in my grandparents' story. I'm looking forward to sharing more of it in this next episode. And for those of you who are new to this podcast, this is a podcast where we believe the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. And this podcast exists to help us go deeper into the Bible, to treasure it, and to become more like the man of Psalm 1.